Hello again, I'm Kenny Fikes, your host of the I Know.media Roundtable, where we bring you conscientious clarity through both reasoned analysis and application. How are you guys tonight? What's up, Elisa? <laughs> so much, so much, Kenny. Hey guys, I'm Elisa Simmons, and I am a Montessori guide and a person who's passionate about our political system and the history of our country. So tonight's conversation is going to be nothing more than you would expect. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Jay Sheree, but people who love me affectionately call me Jay. Um, I'm a mom, I'm a physician and um, a really concerned citizen. And honestly, um, I'm, I'm exhausted and overwhelmed, overwhelmed. Um, and I hope that for those of you who are watching or listening, um, this show provides some solace and some respite to you where you can kind of come and just hear these ideas passed around for how we can behave in a way that is positive and, and establishes hope for one another. I for one need this tonight because the volume of information that we've gotten in the last two weeks, it's been an overload for me and I'm overwhelmed. And today I just felt numb and disconnected and that's not a good place to be. So I'm glad to be here tonight because I know that my comrades can help draw me back in so I can start thinking about constructive things that I can do to really be of service to my household, my community and our nation. I think there's a lot we can probably still do, but we just need to, to hold each other up right now because it's a little crazy. Indeed. And in direct response to what you just said, I think a lot of people are feeling pretty exhausted with what's going on in the country right now. And there's so many different things. It's not just one thing to be upset about or weary or overloaded by. Um, and I think in some ways, the politics of it all from unfortunately the, the top office in the land is to in some ways hope that you'll just forget about it and say, oh, what the hell and, and, and leave it alone. Um, but we have to be as stalwart as they've been about it and not normalize it. We've got to keep talking about it. We're sick of talking about it, but if we stop talking about it, we will normalize it. At least half the country is still saying what the heck is going on. So um, if, if I knew how to do it, or I don't know, paid for it or had a budget or something for thing music, I think in what we've been talking about, it really ought to be Marvin Gaye's What's Going On, Mercy, Mercy Me, some of that stuff. Because if you, if anyone listening, if you haven't listened to the words to Marvin Gaye, who um, in college, I, I didn't discover in college, I discovered as a young boy, but some of the music and the deeper words, I remember um, Comrade and I used to, sit around in our dorm and listen to it. And we point out, he point out more than I would. He'd say, man, this guy's prophetic. Think about this. It's happening then, it's happening now, maybe in the future. So anyway, with that said, today's show, um, POTUS has COVID-19. Should we be empathetic? We never want to wish another person harm. We want to do better than that. We want to be better than that. Hopefully most of, you know, we like to give mothers credits. Hopefully, mo credit, hopefully most, most of our mamas raised us better than that. Um, two wrongs don't make a right. We all get that. But again, in the words of Marvin Gaye, makes me want to holler and throw up my hands. So let me frame this conversation a little bit and then we'll start with one of you guys, go with one of you guys from there. But thinking about the debate that was in our face recently, the arrogance, the hubris, the ne negligence, the ignorance, the lack of care for others. When you look at everyone else who came to the debate, as in candidates, families, and friends, and the team, uh, Team Biden had on masks. Team Trump did not have on masks. They were offered masks, and they turned them away. And now sort of the pundits are saying, well, this is a free country. You know, we get to make individual decisions and everyone has been tested, but that's not the point. The point is that it's for other people, public safety. I wear a mask and, and I will say, I forget sometimes. There are some times, right? I mean, right now, I, I forget. Some days I find myself around people and I go, damn it, I forgot my mask. Usually I go back and get it, but sometimes I don't because I'm there and the car's five minutes away. So we make mistakes, but this was a national televised thing and they were all there. And the idea of talking about personal freedoms is, you know, make those comparisons like to speeding, right? There's a speed limit. 
we don't get to just get in our car, buckle up or not buckle up and drive 100 miles an hour on any given Sunday on any given freeway because it's about protecting other people. Same with a mask. You don't get to say this is my right to not wear a mask because you may be sick and you may infect someone else. So you do have a right to not wear a mask, but stay at home if that's if it's so inconvenient for you. So further framing the conversation, the day before, I believe it was the day before, not of, of the debate, Mr. Trump learned that Hope Hicks, who had been, let me just say it like I'm going to say it, all in his face in the helicopter and, and Air Force One and an office of everywhere else, had tested positive. And after that, he chose to get on a plane and go to New Jersey. And when he did that, did he consider the pilots, his aides, the Secret Service people, the young interns around him, old donors that he was going to meet. Um, he mocked Biden even in the debate for wearing the mask when, all, when in all likelihood he was infected at that time. Um, he even mocked a reporter at the White House, if any of you guys saw it, and said, you're just trying to be politically correct. So that's the framing of the conversation today. Um, who wants to start us off? You go first, Jay. <laughs> yeah, there's so much to unpack with this. So first off about um, trying to be the biggest people we can be. Let me admit that I was small this weekend. I've been real small these last 48 hours because um, you know, part of me wants to be like, yeah, well, we told you so. But that's just the tip of the iceberg, right? Because the we told you so is like that petty comment you make when somebody should have just done something different. But this is so far different. The thing is that he's, he's kind of, not even kind of, he's endorsed really irresponsible behavior with him himself, his staff, and the country. He's done it so much, he's been toxic with it. Think of all the public health officials who lost jobs because the governors of their state didn't want to hear what they had to say because Trump said that this really wasn't a threat when everybody wanted to see the, the businesses reopen, there were a lot of people who lost jobs because they tried to report the correct information to their communities and they tried to implement uh, public health safety measures. Let's look at Dr. Fauci. This man has been ridiculed. I mean, it's just, it's unconscionable how he's been treated. And so this has been going on for a long time. And that's part of what makes you so angry because it's not just like kind of a quiet non-compliance. It's an in your face, I'm not doing that. Y'all don't have to do it. And to the point that it's become politicized, science has become politicized. So it becomes a liberal versus conservative thing, Democrats versus Republican. Why the hell is it that? This virus doesn't give a damn about your political party, but it's because of all of this rhetoric of his. And yeah, he had the gall to get on the plane, but what's worth, I gotta know why Hope Hicks was on the plane. Cause she knew she, and she not only was positive, she had symptoms. What the hell? Why was she on the plane? Why was she going anywhere? She needed to be home and she needed to not leave her home until she had a negative test. So let's start there. So, but we know that he endorses irresponsibility and his cabinet. And we know that they're so childish that they would actually mock and demean other people for it. We're not surprised at him, but it's disgusting. And so for him to turn around and get it, yeah, you wanna be like, I told you so. I mean, you'd like to say it in a lot less delicate fashion. And I'm going to be honest with you, you know, there's a, a petty part of me that wants to see him suffer. But there's another part of me that does want to see him suffer, not just because I feel he's been so horrible, but because I think his supporters need to see him struggle. They need to see him having trouble breathing. They need to see him getting exhausted when he's giving an address. Because they need to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that this virus is horrible. When it's not deadly, it still has the capacity to cause great harm, not just now, but in the future. We've, we're finding about, out about people who survived it and go on to have chronic lung disease, chronic cardiac issues. This is not a joke. So I really feel like he needs to, he needs to have some serious symptoms and, and the world needs to see it. Or they need to see that he just can't even give a press conference because he's that fatigued and he feels that lousy. And he needs to be uncomfortable enough that he comes clean with America. Right, because right now, in my opinion, he owes America an apology. He definitely owes Fauci an apology. 
He, but he owes the public an apology. He needs to say, yeah, I knew it was bad. Y'all know I knew it was bad. And now it really is bad, y'all. This is what it feels like to happen. And we need to do something different. Now, I don't think he'll ever do that, but I really hope that he becomes uncomfortable enough that he even thinks about it. Well, I heard someone say on some, some, some medium today that basically the president of the United States is the safest person in the world and coronavirus got to him. And of course we know that he has been negligent in his approach to it, but he's the safest person in the world. Um, a movie, when you talk about, I don't think it's petty. I just think that this guy has poked at us and poked at us and prodded us and prodded us so much that we're just human. Um, you know, we've all cried at movies, a movie that made me cry. I think Mel Gibson did a really good job in Passion of the Christ when we watched Christ bearing his cross and beat him in the thorns. That really tugged at me badly. Um, but then the thing that really reminded you of who Christ was was that scene with him on the cross when these guys had sold, you know, what those, I don't remember exactly, the guys that sold them out, et cetera, and they're mocking him in a way. And, and he looks at them and then he looks up to God and he says, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do while he's on the cross. I mean, so there was only one Jesus and we can't beat him. Um, so I don't think we need to beat ourselves up for wanting to beat the hell out of somebody who's been smacking us around all day. What do you got, Elisa? So I, um, am not in the frame that I hope that he gets as bad as he can only because, um, I think the spin on it would be just as detrimental as um, any other spin he's put on any of his on his things. I think that we all know, you know when people talk about now AIDS, HIV is are not is not something you die from. And the first person someone brings up is who? Magic Johnson. They're like Magic Johnson still healthy weight like well the next line in that back in the 90s was we don't have Magic Johnson money. And so I think people don't realize that we don't have the whole wing of a hospital dedicated to our care. Um, but I think the spin that would go on it, even if he was winded giving a press con uh, a conference, would be, look at this great man. He is about to die and he's going to do his unpaid duty because he's not even taking a paycheck and he's up here having breathing issues but he's going to address the people because he loves america so much and so i think it would actually embolden his supporters even more they would feel so proud of this great leader and how could we not see him as such and so i think that if he got the extreme of the sickness that's what the spin would be for us i have an issue and i hate being a conspiracy theorist but i have an issue that this was so conveniently located like or not located but so convenient to the cause right now it's taking attention from a huge amount of other issues um you know and the democrats did what the democrats do the democrats tend to try to be the sympathetic party the understanding party the people party the one that cares about someone's person over politics that's that's what democrats try to do and, and they did it and so if this was a strategic move to announce that all these people have covid and it's not really that big of a deal they all went to the doctor for a few days and they're all better then then it feeds into another plan to make everybody oh it's we don't need to wear your your mask because it's not that big of a deal. Once again, not remembering we don't have Trump medical care, but you know, so I, so for me, it's one of those. I'm trying to keep in my mind. I'm not going to become the person I despise. I'm not going to become one of the people I dislike, and 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 so I'm not going to participate in the. You know, I hope he gets it the worst case because I don't think we would get anything as a country if he did, and. But then I don't necessarily believe that he has it. So, yeah, I've, I've heard a lot of people theorizing that, um, that he didn't get it. And part of it is something you said earlier when you were speaking is as a distraction. But um, <laughs> I slept at a Holiday Inn last night, but I'm not a doctor. So let me go there again. Uh, perhaps what they're trying to do is prove this herd immunity thing, right? If he doesn't really have it, they don't wear a mask and then they get better. And they should say, yes, everybody get it and come out of it. Um, I don't know, but perhaps Jay has, has read with a better understanding 
some things that I've just glanced through, which indicate that even with, no matter what your socioeconomic status is, or let's just say economic, um, that there's not a whole lot money can do for you with COVID right now, um, except make you more comfortable if you get extremely sick. Um, I think the, the only thing, if I'm mistaken, that the president could possibly have would be if he has some treatment that the rest of us don't have, right? Like some experimental thing that he has access to that we don't have access to. Um, so yeah, that's um, what I think. So what do you guys think about the idea when we're thinking about empathy that he has mocked so many people? Um, do you do y'all have an image in your head of him mocking the, the disabled reporter when he was contorting his hands and his face and everything? And he did sort of that same thing about Hillary Clinton when people were saying in 2016 that she was, she was, I don't know, did she have the flu or was she weak? Yeah, no, she was, had the flu. She was weak. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and he did this whole thing on stage where he walked around like sort of gimping and mm -hmm. turkey necking and whatever he was doing. I mean, just a horrible thing. Um, said John Kane wasn't a hero because he got captured. Um, I, I feel crazy saying this on a screen with all women, and I wouldn't say it, but it's the president, you know, said he grabbed women by the peas, right? You know, like, I mean, just who is this man? Jay, talk about that, perhaps empathy again. Like, how does, how should we respond to all that when this man falls ill? So, uh, um, some self-disclosure, I have not shown him any empathy since this started, I just want you to know. So I don't know if I'm the person to tell you how to do that. Um, you know what, honestly, I think when, the way that I'm gonna need to process this to get through it and, and be as mature as possible is that I have to remember that like, he doesn't need my empathy and he doesn't give a damn about me. But the reason I probably need to show him empathy is for my own spiritual comfort, right? Because when you're pissed off at somebody and resentful at them, Half the time they don't even know. It's you who's worrying about it and stressing over it and getting your high, your pressures up every time you think about them, right? So for my own sanity, I need to be able to show him some grace and really even some forgiveness. Because oftentimes mm -hmm. forgiveness is not for the other person, it is for you. And so that's how I need to process it. Because personally, I have a really hard time with it. You know, it's not that it's not like he's just had this one time that he made a comment that was just way out there and he'll always be remembered for that comment, but it's just always, he disparages everyone from women to people of color, to Muslims, to the disabled. And I mean, he's just as inappropriate. He's completely unpresidential. And I hate to say that he's childish because I feel that that is insulting to children. He's immature and he shows it and he's not afraid to show it. He doesn't care what you think. And the people around him, speech writers, everyone who prepares him for the public appearances, you know that they must be holding their breath every time he walks out to the podium. They must be like, what is he gonna say? Right, because he's always going off on a tangent and he says all the wrong things. He's got no emotional IQ and he doesn't care. And so we can think of things going back for however long. Yeah, he ridiculed Hillary Clinton. It's ironic that he did, right, because now presumably he's in her position. And to be his age, and to be someone who probably doesn't have the greatest health, you'd think he wouldn't ridicule anyone, but he does. And, he, and it's belittling, and it's so beneath any professional person. Think about it. If you walked into a boardroom and there was some discussion and you had a board member who started ridiculing people about silliness, stuff that gets discussed on a playground, you know, that you'd be like- And making up names for them. Right. I mean, you know, and, and America has come to accept this. We've never had another president do that. And we should never want to have another one. What example is set for our children for behavior? Come on. So, you know, his, his behavior is not surprising, but it's alarming and you keep seeing it. And it makes it very difficult to give him any grace because he seems to not take anything seriously. And he seems like he's only happy when he can make an obnoxious comment and unfortunately, his base loves it. They love it. And that's the bigger problem. Because if they did not embrace it and endorse it, he would stop. But he knows that they love it. And he'll get up there and say, y'all love me. They do. 
and they love him because he's obnoxious and they like to see somebody else get torn down. That's, That's right. what I think. They all, he, he only has a hammer and everything's a nail and he has to have someone to hate. So here's how I think about it too. Um, and, you know, you have to come from an experience to have, oh, by the way, so at this point in my life, I've never had any fear about like, for whatever reason, I know that not everyone's life is the same, you know, black people who live in certain places in Mississippi, out in the country with county sheriffs and stuff. I mean, it's different and in, in across the land. But I personally have never been afraid. This is the first time in my life where I feel on alert about things that could happen to me based on the temperature in the country in which I live. And so if I would have likened that to being an enslaved African and the master got sick, hell, I hope he dies. <laughs> you know, I mean, like, I'm not saying I hope the president dies. I'm gonna clean that up in a minute, but I'm making a point from the perspective of a black man in this country. If I think that someone's gonna unleash the hounds on me and he gets sick, how in the hell am I supposed to feel about him? Right? Do I want, to, want him to get well so he can do it? That's an interesting thing. So, you know, we talked about before, I, 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 I talked about the imagery in that movie with Samuel L. Jackson and Matthew McConaughey, when McConaughey was talking to the jury and he had them close their eyes and he talked about that whole event with the little girl. And he said, now open your eyes and imagine she's white. Well, another thing that happened in that movie, which is pretty telling, when you talk about you can be a good man or a good woman, a good person. Samuel L. Jackson was a good man in that movie. He was a good family guy, a good husband, a good father, et cetera. Not everyone around town loved him. But when they said you act something to the effect of you, 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 um, they were trying to put him on trial, like for hating these guys. And he said something to the effect of, yeah, I hope they die. I hope they burn in hell. You know, something like that. I don't know if you guys saw the movie. I did. So when you're, so when you're dealing with pure evil, you know, I don't want to get in the pulpit here, but that's when God really tests you if you're a person of faith. Now, with that said, I don't wish death on the president personally, as I sit here today. I don't wish great illness on him. Um, and I'm not saying it to be politically correct, because if I were, I wouldn't have said the things I just said. The truth is, it's not who I am to want to wish ill on him and want to wish him death. Um, and, he, and if he did die and become like so unhealthy, we had to invoke the 25th Amendment, it would not bode well for the country. This guy being a martyr or close to a martyr for his people would set them off just like lighting a, fatch, a match, I think, as well. Um, it would be, be bad for our democracy. So no, I don't, I don't wish it on him, but you know, <laughs> if he could kind of suffer a little bit, you know, for a while, be in great pain for a while, and then, you know, <laughs> come back mad as hell. I don't know, maybe that, right? Poking with some needles or something, a lot of needles, take a lot of blood. Um, but, but the real question is why should we be, why should we feel empathy for one of the least empathetic people in the world? And given the amount of power that he has, you could argue that he, is indeed of the billions of people in the world from his office and the way he acts, the most empathetic person on earth. What do you got, Lisa? Well, we've, I, I brought up the ideal before that we, sh that I wish I would have asked Trumpers, not Republicans, Trumpers, where their moral line was in the sand and if they've crossed it. And that's where it is up for me. My moral right. line in the sand is, I'm, I, I, I can't, I'm not going to take pleasure or play with the idea that he should get, that he should severely get hurt. One, I don't think it would do us any good, but, um, I think it would do us just as much damage as what he already is currently doing to us. Um, but I think that, um, we, I have a shirt. My husband has a shirt that says, kill your master. And some people get really offended by that when he wears it. Um, but the ideal behind that is anything that's controlling you you need to be able to take control away from. I talk to that about my students all the time when your brother is pointing at you, but not touching you. Like if you get mad at them because they're looking at you, then that's, you've given them your power. And so I can't give Trump or Trumpers my power. For me, one of my very first questions, if someone that I know has a different political view than me, wants to talk to me about politics. My very first question now is, is Donald Trump overweight? 
And if they tell me that he's not, then I just simply say, we cannot have this conversation because you have, you can, you have eyes, you can see with your eyes and you choose not to believe what your eyes tell you because your leader has told you not to. And so that is not a Republican. That is a loyalist and you can't have an open-minded conversation. And so that's where I've kind of had to take the moral high ground because I know myself and I know that I can be really assertive with my words. And, and sometimes you can't, as a person to people I know in real life, you can't always take back your words. And so that's where I'm at. Like I'm trying my hardest to be all right. Like it's going to, it is at this point, it's going to be what it's going to be. Trumpers are going to vote for Trump. Not everyone who isn't a Trumper is not going to vote for Trump. I think you said a lot of really profound, astute things in those few minutes. Um, I particularly like the question of where someone's moral ground in the sand, moral line in the sand is. Um, and I agree, but I'll even take it to the next step that you can't take things back. I am not one, doesn't matter who, you know, I mean, people can disagree, but maybe it's just my mindset, no matter how angry I've ever been in my life. So I'm just going to project myself on the other people. I think people make excuses. I don't think people get angry and say things they don't mean. I think they didn't mean to say it, yeah. <laughs> but I don't think people say things they didn't mean. Some people just have less control than others because I can't think of a single solitary time as angry as I've ever been with any individual in any kind of relationship, whether it's father to child or me to up or, or, America, whatever. I always know what I'm saying. I never popped out with something that I didn't need. <laughs> so, you know, I just think people use that as a crutch. But that moral line in the sand thing is an interesting one for now because it's really drawing lines between friends and even families in some places. Because to me, the idea of political differences is now we've moved beyond. It's not just about who you vote for and we. We can agree to disagree. No, the hell we can't because racism is not open for debate. And I think that when you support Donald Trump, you have turned a blind eye to things like, is he overweight? Or did he, um, was he willing to speak against white supremacists? Or what did he mean by good people on both sides? What did he mean by stand by and stand down? That's not who you vote for anymore. I'm sorry. That is, that is a position you're taking and that is beyond politics. Um, Wait, real quick, Kenny, did you guys yeah. see that? Because I, I do agree. He, Donald Trump was handed the opportunity to say white supremacy is a horrible idea. Did you guys see that the Proud Boy leader spoke out against white supremacy? Like he outright said it. Yeah, yeah. I, I saw that he tried to frame it as something else, just like the KKK used to try to frame um, upstanding white citizenship and morality. Right. Yeah. And makes, uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was just interesting to me that Trump wouldn't just say white supremacy isn't right. We are not like, but the Proud Boy leader came out and said clearly, and it's just like, huh? Like, I think y'all have a disconnect in your group meetings. That's right. He's smarter. He's smarter. Uh, what do you got, Jay? On which question? Well, so let's talk about um, let's talk about the illness and empathy again, because that's what we're talking about. I'm just going to read a few bullet points I jotted down on the illness, some things that he did. He downplayed it. He pushed responsibility to the governors. He demanded that they allow businesses to reopen too early so that the economy would look good, so that the economy would look good before the election. And he muzzled and disputed experts at the CDC. And now he has it. Yeah, I mean, it's that's part of what makes it so hard to have empathy because there were so many instances of him not only discounting it, but being really destructive with the people who were in this, you know, the, the workers who were trying to um, do what they could to keep our country safe. And then he was undermining in that he said he, he wants his base to believe that it was a conspiracy. This isn't a real thing. This is somehow the whole world has engaged in this conspiracy against him and his, his supporters would like to believe that. That's part of why I feel like it is important for him to become really uncomfortable. Uncomfortable like the people who died uncomfortable, but, but to not die because he needs to be able to say, this was bad y'all, wear your damn mask. But I don't know that his mind will ever allow him to, you know, 
Um, but it, but it's hard because of all of that. I, I don't know that, you know what I think is gonna happen for me? I think there are gonna be times that um, I can try to give him some grace and then there are gonna be times I just simply cannot. You know, I have a good friend who lost her 37 year old sister to this. And I remember how heart wrenching it was for her when her sister was admitted and taken to the unit and placed on a ventilator. And she could go to the hospital, but she couldn't go in there to see her sister. And after her sister was on the vent for a week, and it was futile. I mean, you know, every day the, there was just total white out of her lungs. You know, her sats were going down, like there was just nothing getting better. And my friend is a nurse anesthetist, so she understood the science behind it. And, you know, she couldn't, she was like, I wanted to be with her and I wanted them to just turn off the sedation so she could hear me say that I was fighting for her and that she wasn't alone and I love her. And she was like, I couldn't. And she's like, it's, it will always haunt me. It's heartbreaking to me. You know, these are the things, it's, it's after a while you hear of the deaths and it just becomes a number, right? This many people died. But when you hear accounts like that, that's the stuff that he's perpetuating. That's the stuff he has no respect for, no regard or reverence for. When he is ridiculing someone who has on a mask, that person is preventing another family from going through what my friend's family went through. And I have no respect for that, right? When I think about that, it pisses me off. And now I don't wanna give you any damn empathy. I want you to feel what her sister felt, but I want you to wake up from it. You know what I want? Because like I told you, I was petty this weekend. I gave it a lot of thought. I want you to be intubated without sedation. So you feel the tube, right? You still got your gag reflex and you can't get the tube out and you get to sit there and you get to be alone. Cause I bet you right now he's not alone. I bet you they are not doing anything to observe a protocol of no visitors, which you want to bet, right? So he doesn't even get to experience it in the way these people did. But I think he <coughs> Because now you tell me if you're gonna ridicule it after you go through that. I don't know, maybe he would. But you know, pain is pain. It no matter how much money you got, pain is pain. I'll tell you that it annoys me and I find it hard to be sympathetic even because right now he is getting a treatment that most Americans could get. He's getting a $50,000 drug cocktail, which by the way, is manufactured by a company that he has an interest in that he didn't disclose in 2020. That in 2017, he had $100,000 in capital gains, right? You and I get to pay for that. We probably were paying our taxes. So our taxes are taking care of that for him. Yep, I'm sorry, I'm real petty. That pisses me off. You know and what, so Jay, I think that, oh, sorry, Jay. That's what other right. people don't. And he cheated America. In a million and one ways. So when I think about all of those things that go into it, yeah, I'm, it's really hard to, to have any empathy for him. Yeah. Go ahead. I think that, and that would be, I think sometimes you've got to sit and observe. And I think that if Biden's camp, I get taking down the more aggressive ads towards the person Donald Trump or towards the family Donald Trump, but there's only one ad Biden needs to run right now. And it was, it should be, he couldn't keep himself safe. So why do you trust him to keep you safe? Like he handed them the perfect one like that. Cause that's for anyone who's not a loyalist, that's going to ring true to them. No, no. What I was saying in response to Jay saying, if he's suffering and he could feel the two, you know, maybe he would learn something. I don't think he would because this idea that he's an empty shell and he's incapable, I think is a deal. Like I shared before that in 2016, a personal friend of mine said that all he, all Hillary would have to say to him is what part of until death do his part do you not understand? And I told my friend, he would just make up a story about they were going to get divorced. Like in this case, um, you know, so he's an empty shell. He wouldn't come out of it with any empathy for other people. Um, you said something that just like Elisa said, in her last go around the horn, um, what's the moral line in the sand? I think that's a good article and a good show almost itself. You said something else that is, is profound, but I hadn't thought about. And when a person has so much going on, you know, you're grasping at what you respond to. You don't think about the simplest thing in front of your face. And Jay, you just said the whole world, like he acts like the whole world is, in this conspiracy against him, the hoax, the Democratic hoax. Like the Democrats got 
everyone in the world to get in on this thing. Well, so there's been so much going on that that simple thought didn't even cross my mind when he says it. I just think like, that's ridiculous, but literally the whole world would have had to be in on it. So, yeah. yeah and um, it would just be so much easier for the Democrats to get people to vote than to go get entire nations to conspire against Donald Trump. Yeah, yeah. And people, and people, and I didn't think about it either. So um, one place that I see also, um, I was reminded yesterday how serious it is. Um, I, I own a commercial property that my tenant is, is a funeral home. And I was through there yesterday talking to um, the owner of the funeral home and he had on a mask and he just automatically puts it on when he goes into the building and it's just his people. I don't, there were no customers, you know, clients or anything, but just when they go in and out and there's two or three of them in the building, he does it. He got out of his car, put it on automatically, went in there and there was no one in there when I saw him walk in there. It's just a habit. He's gotten into it. But I was talking to him in the parking lot about how many people are dying and how many African-Americans, because this is an African-American funeral. Home. And it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy. I have a first cousin who was an undertaker or director in DC in the nineties, in the late eighties and nineties. And he just, what was going on in DC in terms of violence and they could not, they never got a chance to slow down almost seven days a week with the burials. And right now, this guy is experiencing that in the black community with all the people. So where do you got, Jay, uh, Elisa? I think that that's um, what a lot of people aren't thinking about, is that even though th that statistically, like right now, I think there was a new study released that the majority of children under 17 that died are black or brown, um, that died ba because of COVID. So, so as much as you can't say you can, you're protected against this disease, depending on your income or your social your social level in the society, it, it does look like that. It looks like if you are don't have access to medical care, if you're not going to the doctor regularly, if you're being parented by a parent who learned not to go to the doctor regularly, unless you're on death's bed, you're not getting taken in because you have a cough, you know, you're... It, so it does look as though Trump would be on a better level, a playing field when it, so it, it touching Trump isn't going to have the same effect as it touching someone in my tax bracket or below my tax bracket. And so I think that that's one of the things that we have to look at is that the effect of COVID is different in different communities. And no, I, I, I completely agree that most of the people that get COVID are going to be okay. It makes complete sense to me, but you don't need to be, you don't, I don't want to, I don't want to tempt it. Like, that's just my thing. Like most people who bungee jump are going to be okay, but there have been a few that have died and been squished on the ground. I don't want to take my risk bungee jumping. Like, I don't want to take my risk with it. I don't want to take my risk exposing my mother, my mother-in-law and all them. So I think that that's what we have to think about when you're, when you feel like putting a mask on your face is somehow compared to slavery or compared to oppression like go get you a damn make america great mask again and wear it like i don't care what your mask says make a statement with it but wear the stupid thing it makes sense yep you, you know right. this business about having the right not to wear a mask i think americans don't stop and think about how many things are regulated when it comes to the public safety so unless you are an anti-vaxxer, which most people are not, just the vaccines. Seeming to me, you would say, I have the right not to get a vaccine because that's invasive, right? I mean, if you get an STD, your right to privacy is gone because guess what? Your doctor has to report it to the Department of Public Health. Department of Public Health is going to get in touch with you. And they're going to be like, we heard you had gonorrhea. We didn't know who you've been with. Because if you don't call them, we will, right? So no one's saying, oh, my right to privacy. And, and it doesn't matter your right to privacy because the greater good is what is important. Because we don't want you going out and giving gonorrhea to two people who didn't give it to 10, who didn't give it to 20 more, right? And so we have all of these protocols in place. We've always done this. And it's not as if a mask is invasive. That's, that's what's been so incredibly ironic about it, that people are ready to fight. Fight, 
Like, I mean, folks are getting shot because you have people in stores who are like, you can't come in without a mask. And then there's a fight. That's because of him. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that, that type of harm that he has done, we can't even measure. Yeah, I, I was at a restaurant recently. Again, one of those things is a mask. You try to wear a mask, you be around, but the guys on, you know, and I consider myself a leader, but sometimes you just kind of cross your fingers and go, what the hell? It's not smart, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm owning it, but we're on the bikes. And I remember the first few times I always have my mask and guys are walking up and I'm, I'm about to say a curse word to one of my friends, like, get, get the hell away from me. Like, what are you doing, right? Like they're walking all up and I'm like, we're on bikes out here in the open, that's cool. So we decided to go to this place to eat barbecue after one of the rides. And I was asking the waitress, um, you know, what people are acting like towards her. And she basically told us that people get really angry. And some people get really angry that she's wearing a mask. And it's crazy, you know, and that is from, like you said, I'll look at some of my notes again. It's from the POTUS, you know, promoted even crank cures for this thing. He held masks campaigns. He encouraged his followers not to wear a mask. All of those things. Um, so let's kind of flow into a little bit of Democrats. Um, you know, I think it's, we all know that I've been a Republican for years. I'm not a, I'm not a Trumper. So, you know, like, I don't even know how people say, like, would think that I ever voted for Trump just because I'm registered as a Republican. How anybody would ever think that. But anyway, um, one of the things, it wasn't just policy, but one of the things year ago, years ago, that first started to turn me off to Democrats was like, imagine if you were watching, if you're at a boxing match and one kid will, you know, put his dukes up and tighten his gloves on and he'll fight and he'll stand the toe and he'll go there and he'll bob and weave. And the other one just goes, man, he hit me too hard. The rules say you can only hit half speed. And he just gets his ass beat every time. And he does that. I was like, that's what Democrats do. They always bring knives to gunfights. They always try to take the high road. And I'm not talking about morally, like this sort of, and I'm not being me, but sort of this, and I think it's one of the reasons they lost some of the people like in Wisconsin and Michigan this last time against Trump. Almost like a little bit of an elitist. Like, I'm not gonna say, there's there's times when it's appropriate to say, fuck you. There's not a lot of them in life, but there's some. But the Democrats take to this road of like, I can't use that word. Well, then you lose, right? Because people wanna see folks stand up and be tough and you lose and people forget what you have to say and you let them bully you and you let them get 10 minutes on the floor to every three that you get. In basketball, this is not a rail for me. It may, I think it makes a point, an analogy. I don't like to just call foul. I mean, I haven't played in years, I don't play now, but back when I played a lot, you don't just go to the hole or shoot and call foul every time you miss. To, my, to me, that's kind of cheating, right? Like you just, you miss and you call foul. But there were environments in which I played back in the day that I called files that I normally wouldn't have called because I knew if I didn't, we would automatically lose because the guys on the other team always call file every time they miss. So if we try to play honestly and not call file, that means that for every shot we get, they get about four and you can't win. Dems don't get that. So with that said, here's some of the points. Joe, Bra Joe Biden's praying for Donald Trump. Kamala Harris sends him a heartfelt wishes. President Obama reminds us that we're all in this together and we want to make sure everyone's healthy. The Biden campaign's taken down all negative television advertising. The Trump campaign's negative ads continue to run nonstop. At the same time that Biden and Harris and Obama offer prayers and consoling words, the Trump campaign, what would they do? The Trump campaign blasted lying Obama, phony Kamala Harris, and sleepy Joe isn't fit for presidents. So this whole Democrat idea of we want to act decently and fairly, you know, protect the norms, but Trump, is, Trump isn't playing by the rules. And I know Franklin said he's playing by the rules, but I have a different view on that because remember I talked about what I felt was not legal precedent for precedent. So um, what do you guys got for that? Go ahead, Jay. Whoever, who was last? I think Alisa. Um, Go ahead. I think that Honestly, when, when you look at what the Democratic platforms have been now for decades, I think the Dems are, their ideology is more one of compassion. Mm -hmm. That's why so many, I think that's why so many of our liberal laws have to do with the care of others, taking care of others. 
that as a community, we should be able to provide for those who are sick. We should be able to make sure that everyone has health care. We should make sure that education is not just equal, but equitable. We programs like affirmative action, all of these things, housing programs, all of the things that Republicans tend not to want to finance. The Dems think to do that because their mindset, I think part of why you, you become a Democrat, um, you know, I mean, you may have been raised in a household, but part of why it appeals to me, like, I mean, a Republican agenda would probably be more helpful for my socioeconomic status. But the reason I would probably never be a Republican is that it's liberal policies, democratic policies that have allowed me to get to where I am today. And so the Dems, I think, think about things in a more compassionate way. And I think that you're always going to get um, that degree of humanity from them. Sometimes it's, I find it upsetting because he's so out there and inappropriate. But my God, what would happen if the Democrats stooped to that? And they were just like, you know what? We are all in with this name calling. Let's see, what can we come up with, right? And Joe, when you get to that debate and they say something else to you, we got some cards for you with some words. I mean, imagine what it would become. There would be a point where there would be no more constructive discussion, right? Because certainly we've all had those fights that just devolve into everybody calling each other names. Now, I don't know about you, I have never been in a fight like that that got me anywhere. Nowhere, except angrier, right? And you walk away thinking about all the stuff you should have said that you didn't get a chance to, right? And you have that conversation in your head, you're pissed off for forever. So it's, it's not constructive. And while I would like to see them kind of fight back in that way, I don't think it would get us anywhere at all. And, um, and I don't know that they could be as nasty as this camp, because this is a special type of administration right here. Right. Oh, and we don't and, and I don't know of any other administration that has come close to the poor decorum that they show. No, no, I certainly agree with the, pretty much everything you said, but things go, you know, we talked about two things existing in the same space. There is there are lots of things that I agree with in terms of being compassionate and allowing folks like me or you to become who we become and get to schools we get to, et cetera. Um, but there are also a lot of those social programs that feed the cyclical nature of keeping people where they are, like, oh, poor little black kids, poor little, let me just give them this, let me keep them there and go around a circle, because they don't think you're their equals. I think a lot of liberals think that. Um, so they have to do stuff for you. Um, in terms of the violence, like, you know, of course I wouldn't want people to act like Trump, but what I mean is when someone punches you in the nose, you got to punch them, right? So I, I go to one of these little personal things again. I am y'all y'all want to shake me up, but I'm the father of a child who, at one point, um, because we taught him to not put his hands on people and to solve things with his words and and decorum and follow the rules, that he was allowing this guy to push him around. And finally, after talking to the principal and she couldn't do anything about it, and talked to the teacher, I just said, "Hey, the next time he puts his hands on you, f him up, punch him in his mouth." That's, you, you got daddy's permission because that seems like the only thing that's going to happen. Well, the next time I got the call, it wasn't so-and-so and your child. No, so-and-so was picking on your child. The call was so-and-so and your child got in a fight. <laughs> he grabbed him and he spun him on and he hit him. And he was, I was like, oh my God, you know, from the teacher, like, oh my God, he wouldn't do that. So sometimes I think you just got to punch him in the mouth. I had an employee one time that I used to have to talk to him a little crazy and I would say, I don't care about saying his name. I said, Chris, I hate when you make me talk to you like this, but it's the only damn thing you respond to. Some people, you just got to go there. So <laughs> anyway, what do you got on that, Elisa? Well, you know, I think earlier when I was saying that in the heat of a moment, you'll say something, I not because you'll say it because it, I'm, not because you'll say it because you didn't mean it. Cause I'm, I'm a strong believer. Like, you know how people get liquid courage when they drink. Um, you can't tell me that you did something because you were drunk. Like, I'm, I'm not going to let you use that as an excuse. Like that was, it emboldened you to do something that there was already something inside of you that wanted to do. And, and when that heat of that argument comes across and you, you say things, I am not one that is going to, let you say, well, I was mad and I didn't mean to say it. Um, I know that there's been many fights, uh, especially when I was younger, that I would get into arguments or fights. And I learned very quickly that I could cut with my tongue. I knew that. 
I also knew I could cut with my hands too, but, um, but I knew that my tongue could cut people and it wasn't because I would say things that was untrue. It was because I would viciously say things that were true. And so that's why as an adult, I've learned that I, I can't let myself go there because one time, this is just a story. Um, my husband's friend was in the car with us and I had a, I, he wasn't my favorite person in the world. I felt like he had some issues that made me think that he should go to therapy, but he asked me repeatedly what, if I thought he was a bitch. And, and the first time he asked me, I said, Hey, you really don't want to ask me this question. And the second time he asked me, I was like, Hey, I really don't, you don't want to know the answer to this question. You should let it go. And my husband's sitting in the car like this, please stop asking her this question. So finally he just goes, do you think, um, what do you think about me? And I was like, I think you're a bitch. Cause you act like a bitch. My husband lost a friend that day. And, um, and, and so like, I have to think about what I say. And I think that that's where Democrats don't always, they go so far away from that. That's why actually Joe Biden, the, the debate, I actually appreciate it. Appreciate it. When Joe Biden goes, man, just shut up. And then you see him go, you see him go back to, okay, wait a minute. I'm supposed to be a grown up in this situation, man. He's a clown. Okay, Mr. President, because he, you could see him being a real person and responding the way we all assume we would respond when someone was just that ignorant. But then you could see him go back to, wait a minute, I'm supposed to be the bigger person here. And I think that if people would pay attention to those details in that it allowed you to see that Biden's a real person, but he also has the ability to be presidential. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. Well, you know, God's not finished with any of us. And um, when I when I rail in on myself a little bit, it's not that you know how it's been co become sort of fashionable to be self-deprecating. I'm just being real. Like so, you know, I'll go from this sort of like educated guy of a leader and an entrepreneur to sometimes it just gets a little raw in my head, and it, it takes a lot to set it off. But there's been times I just didn't hit someone not because I really didn't want to hit him. But I looked at him, I was like, ew, I don't want his blood on me. And if I hit him in the nose, he's going to bleed on me. So like, <laughs> I'm thinking it through. Crazy, right? But uh, there are all kinds of things that make you stop. So let's talk about the distraction. Jay, do you think, what do you think about the people who are saying maybe he doesn't even have COVID-19? Because let me run through five, you know, four things. This is distracting from a Supreme Court issue right now. It's distracting from the debate and having shown who he is. Now, he wouldn't do that, but maybe his handlers would say, you know what, dude, you never, you haven't listened to us in three and a half years. Please listen to us now. Shut up. Here's the plan, right? Or you're going to lose. Um, it's, it's distracting definitely from his handling of COVID because it came right back home. So maybe this is the hiding in plain sight. Like, I'm going to act like I get it and then I'm okay. Um, and it's distracting from voter suppression, amongst other things. So do you think it's possible he doesn't have it? Or would you have anything to say about all those things? I'm oh, it's definitely, it's definitely possible because he's, he's so dishonest. And he's capable of any kind of chicanery. Um, I, I think that, though, we're not hearing only about him. We're hearing about all these people who were in his orbit in the last week who are also positive. And so... I believe that he's positive, I do. And I, because I feel this way, is this all a hoax? Like you lying about everybody? Because the interesting thing is there are three Republican senators that we know of who are positive now. And the way, and I'm thinking about this, I'm like, so how are they gonna have this Senate confirmation, right? Cause they are not, so they shouldn't be coming out of their homes. You're supposed to stay home. We do not have a constitution that allows for electronic meetings. Right, so um, presumably they will not have a quorum. And I'm, I'm thinking that they're just too smart to have overlooked that. If that's part of the whole idea, right? We're gonna say the president has it and we're gonna make it look real authentic because we're gonna say you, 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 and you have it too. So say you got it. You can get your doctors to say you got it. But they, they would have had to be more strategic. I believe that there, these three senators are infected. I believe that all the people who claim to have been infected who were at that fundraiser um, also are truly infected. And I think that he is. 
Um, now, I don't know if I feel like he's super sick, but I think he would play it to his advantage. However, he is not beyond all kinds of lies. Honestly, I think the only thing that Donald Trump has not yet done that we know, that we at least we know about it, I don't think he's had anyone killed yet. Because I think that is the last, that's the last frontier for him. But he's capable of any type of deception. I believe that. And so, you know, we have to stay vigilant. But at the end of the day, what can you do? I think it would be a really big gamble on his part, though because there may very well be a lot of Americans who are saying, well, we, we listened. And you know, for those people who are right there on the fence, right? We listened and you said we didn't need these masks, but now you're sick and all these people are sick. So I think that this could go against him. And if he's gambling like that, may or may not work out in his favor. I think they're gonna have to know someone who gets sick. It's gonna have to almost hit home because they don't care. I mean, this guy is starting again with I'm under audit. I mean, seriously, how many times have we heard, if you believe that, I've got a bridge in Brooklyn to sell you. I'm, really? Like four years ago, your taxes were being audited and you're going back into that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're going to see them when my taxes are no longer under audit. You were being audited for four years. Well, yeah, the IRS hates me. They treat me like um, they treated the Tea Party. Like he's trying to say the Obama, the Obama IRS treated the Tea Party bad, so the IRS treats him bad. Dude, this is your IRS. This is Steve Mnuchin. He does what you want, right? So, like, I see him speechless. <laughs> mm -hmm. How does anyone buy that? He's still on the audit because the because IRS treats badly. Because they want to. The people who buy yeah. it don't want to know anything different. Those are going to be that same 30% that never, ever changes. That no matter what he does, there's nothing that will change what they think. But I think there are people who are on the fence, right? And I think there are definitely a lot of reluctant, what I call reluctant Republicans, right? Who just, uh -huh, they don't wanna turn away from the party, but they're like, this is ridiculous right here, right? So those people, those people are the ones that I think he could easily lose just because he's, if he's positive, you're saying you're positive, then you, you've misled the country and you were so stupid, you even got infected. Well, so, I don't even think it's the Republican Party anymore. It's not. <clears throat> this is not a party that George Bush would belong to. This is not a party that Jack Kemp would belong to. Um, it, it just isn't a party that those guys would belong to. Um, I, I, I share with you guys offline, but I'm going to say it here. I, I showed you my uh, Republicans for Biden sign <clears throat> in my yard. And, you know, I never, I was surprised at how many Biden Harris signs I see because my neighborhood, if you describe it, it's like, you know, I, I don't know, 95% white and probably 80% of the people are over 50. Um, and this is Tennessee. This is my neighborhood, I guess. I've, I've seen, first of all, you don't see a bunch of political signs, but of the ones that you do see, Biden Harris, Biden Harris, Biden Harris. There's one Trump dude down the street on the left. Like, and yeah. But what's been interesting that is happening, people have been driving by my house slowly, like looking at the sign and taking a photo of it. And even this old elderly couple riding bicycles up, up past the day, the lady stopped. She was like, oh, do you mind if I take a picture of your sign? I was out in the yard doing work. She took a picture. It's been, become like this novelty thing in the neighborhood. So it's been kind of interesting. What do you, you think, Delisa? You should get a cardboard cut out of yourself, a life-size cardboard cut out with like yourself pointing or like with your thumb up. Cause then that would shock a lot of people even more because of there's such a stereotype to what Republicans look like. And so right. I think it would be like, well, wait a minute. Okay. Now. Okay. Okay. Kenny. Um, you know what? I think that when it, when we think about um, Trump, I, I, as somebody who needs to handle people regularly, I have to handle how parents speak to their children regularly. I have to handle how a children speak to each other regularly. When you have to handle someone regularly, sometimes you have to manipulate situations so that the, the long-term outcome is what you want or what you need. It, I think, and the whole thing I can make fun of about this situation is I think it would be very funny 
if we found out that Donald Trump thought he had COVID because everybody needed him to shut the hell up and they just told him he had COVID and he did it. And they were like, we're going to give him some medicine and make him a little sick. But now he has to shut up for a little bit. Yeah, intubate him. He's completely, just intubate him. We need him to shut up. Like, I think that to me would be hilarious, but, um, but because then it would prove it'd be like, it, it, people are going to control what they need to control. And so I think that the narrative here is what, what I wish that Biden, because if we take Biden away from being a democratic le- uh, presidential uh, um, candidate, if we take that away, because we have so many Republicans like Kenny speaking up and saying, I can't, I can't participate with what I consider Trumpers via Republicans. If we just say Biden is the is the the candidate for people who are not Trumpers, he needs to make sure he gets out there and and hits home about the ideal of he couldn't keep himself safe. How do you trust him to keep your yourself safe in the in the next debate? He needs to say, hey, like. You're going to make fun of my mask today, but in a really presidential way, because that's his, you you can't ask someone to be who they're not. And so, you know, I think that's what the Biden camp needs to focus on is making sure that they're overly heard with their plans and what they think is true and not allow this to be the focus of everybody right now, which is what it is. I think that at the start of the next debate, Biden should walk in and hand him a mask. See, that would be, that would look big and man, magnanimous and humanitarian. It'd be yeah. a smart ass too. Jeez. Give him a MAGA hat. Like, give him a MAGA mask. Be like, hey, <laughs> like, I support I like your, that. your decision. I like that. Yeah. I like that. Give him a MAGA mask. <laughs> Although he couldn't do, give him that advertising for the nation to see. Well, all right, guys, I think it's um, time to wrap up. We're probably at an hour or so now. Um, our producer is going to tell me that I shouldn't have drank coffee on camera, but I want us to call from though. Well, if I had to say one thing, I would hope that when we meet again on Wednesday, I would hope that maybe it's been a slower news week. Like just maybe just be quiet for a little bit, Trump, and don't give us, don't put fuel on our fire this week or like something great happened, like just something. I just don't want to deal with this anymore. Y'all, did he go two days without us hearing from him or a day or what? I think it was one day. One day. Because today he was out. Remember today he did a drive-by and decided that it was okay to expose the entire car of circus, uh, Secret Service members to COVID just so he could go and stroke his ego. So and was he going home or was he still no, on the drive-by? No. no, he just did a drive-by. He might go home tomorrow. Mm. Unnecessary. It was like the Bible. This was like the Bible stunt almost. It was a pull. And that's what I think people need to realize. He is a reality TV show person. He's a reality TV show president. He knows what gets his ratings up. And that's like, oh, we're out. We're camped outside in front of your hospital. Oh, I'm going to go say hi to the people. Like, well, keep your butt. You're supposed to try to get well. So if you die tomorrow, do we get to blame it on your dumb little trip outside the hospital? Like, you have a responsibility to the entire country. You need to keep your butt in the hospital with your medicine. And so here's an interesting thing. This is so. This is one of those I told you so and attitudinal things. I don't mind saying it, but I saw. I didn't. I thought maybe he was going home, but it doesn't matter if he was going home. It makes it even worse that it was drive by. He had a mask on in the car. Yes, he did. <laughs> yes, he did. Which is ridiculous because when you're really trying not to spread the disease, you stay in one place. Quarantine is called that for a reason. Mm-hmm. Right? And it means you stay away from other people to prevent them from becoming infected. So he's not quarantining. You know, he's, he took a little trip and excursion. I, I might even see if he was driving himself. You're in the car with people. What the I hell? Completely. Yes. Yeah. And I, I don't understand because. You know, my, like my worry when I come in from work is that I'm going to expose my household, right? And, and a lot of healthcare providers have that as a concern. Like we're trying to get our scrubs off and jump in the shower because you don't want to expose the people you love. Mm-hmm. He works with these people every day. And for the Secret Service, they're risking their lives for you. I don't know why they would want to do this, but they put their lives on the line every day. Yeah. So you should have a very intimate relationship with them. You should not want to jeopardize them. And masks are great, but they don't guarantee that you will not infect others. Why would you put them at risk? 
Well, we started this show saying it's the arrogance, the hubris, the negligence, the ignorance, and the lack of care for others. Yes. That's what we said. So, y'all, it's been a fun show. Enjoyed it. Good commentary. I'm going to think about whether those things should be articles. Um, Jay talking about the whole world would have to be in on the thing, and Elisa talking about that moral line in the sand. Those are great points, amongst others, but those two stand out to me. Have a good night. Have a good week, everybody. Bye.